Welcome everyone to Women Confront Big Tech. My name is Kylie Davidson. I'm the program coordinator for the Gloria Steinem Endowed Chair Programs. We're so glad you can join us today and we hope you will join the conversation online with our event hashtag, Are You Women in Tech? Uh, for those students who are here for extra credit from their professors, we do have a sign-in sheet for you uh, that is available after the event. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Naomi Klein, who, among many of her accomplishments, is our inaugural occupant of our Gloria Steinem Endowed Chair in Media, Culture, and Feminist Studies. So please join me in welcoming Naomi. Um, thank you. Kylie, for everything you did to make this event happen. <clears throat> As you see, the uh, hashtag is Are You Women in Tech? So turn your phones to silent and get your tweeting digits ready. Or alternately, you could decide that you want to throw your phones into the Raritan, because I think we're going to be talking about the insidious role that they play in surveillance capitalism, among other things. So that is entirely your call. Um, as you heard, um, I am the inaugural Gloria Steinem Chair in Media, Culture, and Feminist Studies. I'm also, also an author and an organizer and senior correspondent at The Intercept. <clears throat> I'm very excited because this is the first event um, that I have organized as chair, my, my first public event, the first of many to come. And I just want to give you a heads up about a few other events that we have coming up uh, in, on April 4th. I'll be in conversation with renowned Anishinaabe scholar and artist Leanne Simpson. We'll be discussing her books, As We Have Always Done, and This Accident of Being Lost, which, touch, which touches on, among other things, the tension of building movements to protect land and water while spending way too much time on social media. Um, on the 24th of April, I believe in this room, uh, I will be in conversation with the wonderful feminist communication scholar, Sarah Benet Weiser, uh, talking about her book, Empowered. And I'm also going to be joined by Kianga Yamada Taylor responding to the book. So stay tuned also for those events, and also an event that's in uh, process, uh, which will be something related to the push for a Green New Deal. A bunch of us are, are trying to pull something together <clears throat> that will uh, be responding to uh, this call and looking at how the climate crisis can be a catalyst to create huge numbers of living wage jobs and also battle racial and gender injustice at the same time. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with uh, this brand new uh, Steinem chair, let me fill you in a little bit. It's a collaboration between Sky, and I'm thrilled that our dean, Jonathan Potter, is here today, as well as our associate dean, Daphna Lemesh. Um, it's a collaboration between Sky and Women and Gender Studies, um, and I think our chair, Mary Trigg, is here somewhere, as well as the Institute for Women's Leadership and Lisa Hetfield, our interim director, is also here to help kick off um, this event. The chair is the result of hundreds of people contributing time and money over several years in order to create a position that honors the legacy of Rutgers alum Gloria Steinem. Now, Gloria isn't easy to categorize. She's a political organizer, a journalist, an editor, an author whose writings have led, uh, have had a huge impact on, um, on feminist scholarship. So inspired by Gloria's heterodox life, the chair is about making connections and crossing boundaries between sectors and disciplines and movements, between women's rights and media and culture and tech and democracy and much more which is why when I learned about the extraordinary work of our two guests, it seemed like a natural fit to bring them both to Rutgers so that we could all cross some boundaries together. Their work is about organizing, it's about tech, it's about democracy, it's about human rights, it's about feminism, it's about labor rights, it's about migrant rights, and it's about resisting militarism. So let me get more specific about who is joining us tonight, uh, today. Uh, Jacinta Gonzalez is the field director for Mi Gente and is based in Phoenix, Arizona. Previously, she worked for Poder in Mexico, organizing the Rio Sonora River Basin Committees Against Water Contamination by the Mining Industry. Jacinta was the lead organizer for the Congress of Day Laborers at the New Orleans Workers Center for Racial Justice between 2007 and 2014. 
Uh, in Louisiana, Gonzalez helped establish a base of day laborers and undocumented families dedicated to building worker power, advancing racial justice, and organizing against deportations in post-Katrina New Orleans. And Mijente, she has been at the center of the movement to reunify families separated at the border. Just last week, she helped re reunify a 17-month-old baby with her Honduran mother, Cindy Flores, after the baby was taken from her father alone at the border. Jacinta is also part of a groundbreaking campaign that she's going to be telling us about today, which is calling on tech giants like Amazon and Palantir to drop their contracts with ICE uh, and um, and no longer build the high-tech infrastructure for these kinds of human rights violations. <clears throat> a few months ago, Mijente came out with this report, um, which is on uh, the syllabus for my course, The Corporate Self, and I really encourage all of you to have a look at. Um, I want to read a key passage to you from, from the Who's Behind ICE report. ICE is preparing to use tech for mass deportation at an unprecedented scale that could make sanctuary city and state level protections obsolete. So very relevant for us here in New Jersey. ICE wants to organize mass personal information it buys from private vendors, such as license plate information, collect intimate biometric information in mass quantities, such as fingerprints, iris scans, facial recognition software, by the cloud space to store the data and hire people to analyze the mass data information, all for surveilling, arresting, and deporting immigrants. Deportation as a for-profit sector uh, for these companies. Uh, um, on Twitter, the Mijente campaign, if you want to uh, look into this more, is called No Tech for ICE. And we're going to be hearing more about what is going on and what lies ahead. We're also joined by Meredith Whitaker, a distinguished research scientist at NYU, co-founder and co-director of the AI Now Institute, and founder of Google's Open Research, research Group. AI Now is dedicated to researching the social implications of artificial intelligence and related technologies, a field I know is of intense interest to many of the communication scholars in this room. She's worked extensively on issues of data validation and privacy. She's advised the White House, the FCC, the City of New York, the European Parliament, and many other governments and civil society organizations on artificial intelligence, internet policy, measurement, privacy, and security. She also played a role in the historic Google walkout this past November, when some 20,000 Google employees from Singapore to Dublin stunned the world by walking off the job en masse. They were spurred by news that a senior Google executive accused of serious sexual misconduct was paid $90 million seemingly to go away. But as Meredith will tell us, sexual harassment is one of many issues driving this movement. Another is growing resistance among tech workers to having their companies participate in that sprawling infrastructure of weaponized surveillance that Jacinta is working on, from the so-called smart border wall to drone strikes. You can learn more about this movement through the hashtag tech won't build it. I wanted to host this dialogue because I think we are at an important moment in our relationship to big tech where there's more space for healthy critical engagement about the social impacts of this sector than there has been in my lifetime. Maybe it's Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook's role in the 2016 election. Maybe it's the critical mass of stories about abusive conditions for low-wage workers at companies like Amazon, including the Amazon warehouses that are our neighbors here in central New Jersey. Maybe it's the fact that more and more people are questioning the impact of social media on their mental health and well-being. Maybe it's all of the above, but something is definitely happening. We see it in New York City's widespread resistance to being selected for Amazon's new headquarters, something that the company had been treating like a bid for the Summer Olympics, but which has since backfired spectacularly. We see it, too, in the way tech workers, particularly low-wage contract workers, are beginning to say scary words like trade union. We see it in the number of people logging off big social media platforms out of concern for their privacy. We see it in growing awareness and debate about how AI is locking in and weaponizing racial and gender biases. We see it in the momentum, particularly in Europe, to find regulatory solutions to rampant privacy violations and tech consolidation. 
And we see it in pathbreaking organizing, the pathbreaking organizing work of both of our guests. So I wanted to start by asking each of you to talk for 15 minutes, uh, sorry, for 10 minutes about your work holding big tech companies accountable, Meredith from the inside and Tacinta from the outside, to give us an overview of, uh, of how you got into that work and where it's going now. Then we'll move into a dialogue between the two of you, which I'll moderate, but we've been collecting questions um, from all of you, so we've got some fantastic questions from the audience that I'll be weaving in. Um, I'm going to ask Jacinta to kick us off, but before you do, I think it might be helpful to watch a video that Mijente produced to go with the launch of that um, terrific report that I mentioned. Well, thank you all so much for, for coming, for taking time out of your, your busy, busy lives to, to be here for what I think is a really important conversation and kind of the beginning of, of a really great intersection that's starting to happen where we're starting to see people outside of tech companies organize against those technologies, but also internally have that solidarity. Um, so my name is Jacinta Gonzalez. I work for Mi Gente. Um, and for folks that don't know too much about our organization, we built Mi Gente to be a political home for radical Latinx folks in the US. And we did it really explicitly with the vision of having an organization that could probably be pro-black, pro-women, pro-trans, pro-queer, pro-undocumented, pro-worker, pro-planet, because we know that our community needs all of those things to be able to actually get to liberation in a true and meaningful way. And so we, we strive to be able to create tools both online and in real life that facilitate organizing. That really is our mission. Um, but we come out of the Not One More Deportation campaign. And that's how I met a lot of the folks that I organize with within Mi Gente. Um, and so as, as was stated at the beginning, I used to organize in New Orleans post-Katrina. There's this interesting moment where it was right after the storm had happened, you know, workers were kind of welcomed in, brought up to, to help rebuild. But a couple of years later, actually a couple months later, there was all of a sudden interactions with the police at every moment. Right? It was the National Guard rolling up to day labor corners. It was employers calling the police when there was wage theft cases. It was immigration raids happening in neighborhoods and in communities. And so we found the need to organize. And you know, as the organizing developed, we started to see really clearly from 10 years ago how tech and immigration enforcement was so closely connected. And one of at least my personal experiences where I started to be like, what is this stuff? was when we started to discover what was later revealed to us was called the Criminal Alien Removal Initiative. And what ICE would do is they would go into communities and handcuff anyone that looked Latino, bring them over and fingerprint them on the spot with these mobile biometric devices. And at the time, no one had heard of these. No one knew what they were. We kept asking national experts, national policy people, what is this? And no one could give us the answer until we started to talk to our folks who were against militarization and against the war in the Middle East. And then they said, oh, we know those. We've had those over here. That's how they open up files on people. That's how they're able to do background checks in war zones. And so we started to really start to piece together how a lot of the technology that is at first used for war is then brought to a militarized border and brought in for policing and immigration enforcement. And then kind of in that process normalized and used in the broader population. And so, you know, fast forward a couple of years, you have this moment where Trump is, you know, we all have our, are we allowed to cuss? Oh, fuck moment, right? Where Trump's president, we're like, oh, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? And everyone was having a conversation about sanctuary. And how do we protect people? How do we make sure that our neighbors, that our workers, that our community people aren't taken up and disappeared in this moment? And one, you know, for us it was an exciting moment because we wanted to welcome people in, but we also wanted to remind folks that actually it was the Obama administration that had the highest record of deportations. So they're kind of welcome in. But then also saying, well, what can we do? Because more and more technology is making local protections very difficult because the information is leaking out in other ways. That's where we started to begin this research project to understand how is ICE getting people's data? Because people were calling us and saying, ICE came to my home. They knew my name. They knew my child's name. They knew my cousin's name. And I haven't had any tickets. I haven't been picked up by the police. 
How did they know my address? I only put this on my cable bill. So we tried to figure out what was the connection between private sources of data and immigration enforcement if at least traditionally people had told us it was just coming from the police before. And that's how we kind of uncovered what's happening with Palantir and Amazon. And we started to understand that now ICE no longer just gets their information from the local police or the state police, but actually they have private vendors that sell them all of this data, right? Whether it's the license plate reader or just getting it from LexisNexis and all of these companies that are storing it up and making these business deals. We're like, well, that's a lot of information. How the heck do they process it all? And that's how we came about to understand what Palantir does. And so Palantir is a program that helps both shift through all of this information, right? Shoot, someone got a you know, no seatbelt ticket in North Carolina, and this is where they get their phone bill, and this is how, where they get their medical expenses. Put it all together and have one centralized file that they can use to both surveil and track people, but also prosecute people, as we saw at the border this summer. Last summer, sorry. And so, you know, Palantir, again, has been using this technology internationally for war for a long time and is now starting to understand that, particularly under this administration, with this rhetoric um, that is so xenophobic, that is so racist, that is so aimed at immigrants, that they're able to use it to kind of expand. And then we realized that they had actually also already been using it in New Orleans without people's consent. So Palantir, what they did is to make sure that the city council, the public government didn't know what was happening, they actually donated their services, which we'll hopefully get to at some point in terms of the tricks of the trade, in terms of how to make sure that there isn't public scrutiny, to be able to have this, to be able to surveil the local community and really actually be targeting the black community and quote unquote gangs. And so we start to see how all of these things became connected in a particular way and how this is really the future of surveillance and policing in this country, but also the world. And how these data systems that Palantir is able to amass are also helping intensify incarceration um, through having more, basically the way that they're doing it is if they can connect all of the information, they can get you. If there's an eye watching us at all times and connecting everything, they will find a way to systematize that and criminalize it so that they can throw the book at you. So for example, what happened in, in, on the border this, this last summer was that something that for many people would just be crossing an invisible line, they create a criminal offense for it. And that's how they justify family separations. The case that was just mentioned from last week, ICE proudly said, yes, we took that child from his father. He was a felon. We deported him once and he came back. That's a felony. And so they systematize this, and Palantir is actually the company that is creating the data system to be able to file, to create a file on someone, to be able to take them anywhere they go and be able to create new offenses. But then that also brought us the question of, well, who's storing all of this information, right? If you have so much new inputs, if you're processing it, if you're creating these big files for people, where are you hosting it? And that's honestly what was most surprising to me was understanding how Amazon really saw this as such a big source of their profit for their company. And so back in 2010, you know, what does Amazon World Services, Web Services or other companies start to lobby in DC. They start to realize that it's not enough for them to have corporations that are making profit, but actually if they lobby in DC, they're able to get the big bucks, which are the big government contracts. And so Amazon has the most federal authorizations, FedRAMP authorizations, than any other company to be able to provide cloud services to the government. Right now, DHS's $44 billion budget, 10% of that is just for data management. The Department of Defense has contracts for up to $10 billion for one company. So you can understand that as much as it's creepy that they know what kind of blender you use or what your shoe preferences are or where you walk by to give you a billboard, it's even creepier that they understand that the actual best way to make money is to take tax dollars from a government that is set on investing so much on policing, deportation, and military. Um, and so for us, it was really important to create a campaign that would expose this because a lot of people don't even know that it's happening. So there is just the first moment of we have to understand the phenomenon of place. Um, they try to send, sell tech to us as if this is this neutral solution 
you know, it's like unicorns, free markets, and technology are like the solutions to most problems um, that people can put out. And so for a lot of us, tech has been sold as something that is going to make things better, that is going to make things easier. Well, yes, but what happens when making it better and easier for the police comes at the expense of millions of people and communities across the planet? Um, and so some of these questions for us have been really important to bring up in this climate. Um, and also in this moment where people are starting to understand the impacts of ICE. If you had asked me two years ago that abolish ICE would be a hashtag that would be used by like the Democratic Party in some instances, I would have told you it was impossible. But I think part of what's happening is as things are escalating, people are starting to realize what's at stake. And that's both exciting, it gives us momentum for the organizing, but it also makes us have to answer really, really big questions. And one of the questions that we realized is we can't do this alone. Just having people on the outside critiquing companies won't be enough. We actually have to have a comprehensive approach to this type of organizing that includes bridging with other folks in other industries. And that's why it's been so exciting to know that there's organizing inside of these tech giants. I mean, we've heard rumors that there's like actual petitions going on in Palantir. Right? That there are workers that are working on these things that are starting to realize the consequences of it and want to take a stand, but in many cases aren't used to organizing. And that's where we can give some tactics, we can have some ideas, we can have conversations, we can bring folks that are undocumented and directly impacted by this to San Francisco to have these conversations with folks at Google, at Salesforce, and say, how can we change this? And so that's why I think it's so exciting to be here today, and, and thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, Zinta. Um, that's a perfect segue. Makes my job easy. <laughs> um, Meredith, I'm going to throw it to you. But before I do that, we're just, we're just going to play another shorter video. Um, and this is just one of the many news reports about the Google walkout. Partly because I was surprised when I mentioned the Google walkout to some people here that not everybody knows about it, so. All right. All right. Hello. Um, I'm still delighted. Um, you know, it's an honor to be up here. I'm going to tell kind of a personal story that will wind back to this. But, you know, I, am, I run a research institute at NYU, which is sort of separate from my Google role. But I've also been a tech worker at Google for 12 and a half years. Um, so for over a decade, I've watched the sort of metastasis of the tech industry from the inside. And you know, I've kind of observed the expansion of technology into almost every facet of our life, into almost every core social institution we have. Um, and kind of during this time, given who I am and my interest, I was working mainly on sort of, you know, social policy issues. So I worked on issues of net neutrality, I worked on privacy, I worked on sort of, you know, where tech meets the fresh air and the people were the places I was interested in and sort of built a research career around that. Um, and through those interactions um, and through sort of communities with folks who were thinking differently outside, I became increasingly concerned about the way these technologies were essentially centralizing power in the hands of a very small number of people um, with very little oversight and accountability. Um, you know, it became, became clear to me, you know, through, you know, th this sort of became clear to me through the dissonance between the sort of, you know, how I was observing products being built, how I was observing things work on the inside, and the marketing rhetoric that I was seeing sort of used to present these technologies on the outside. And I was seeing kind of the story of technology that we know, this sort of cyber utopian dream where, you know, efficiency is never questioned, where, you know, disruption is a, you know, social good, was being written by marketing departments who were supporting a bottom line of a company that were often doing things that were, you know, never spoken about, that were not transparent, that were not accountable to any of the people who were, you know, at risk of harm from these technologies. Um, and so I started speaking about this, right? I started advocating internally. I like practiced my public speaking skills, which was terrifying, you know, in an attempt to be able to communicate clear arguments that would sort of shift the needle, right? 
Um, I, you know, I wrote about it. I, you know, you saw my strange bio, right? I like advised the White House. I did as much as I could to try to, you know, say, hey, this is, you know, th there's some mismatches here, and we need to recalibrate because we can do some, you know, we can do some harm, or you know, there's a problem here. You're buying something, but you don't seem to understand what you're buying, you know. Um, and what became clear to me through this journey was what I'm sure is clear to many of you here today, um, that the system was not a mistake, that this was not the result of a misunderstanding, that I was not going to be able to present a you know, riveting argument that would pull the wool off of people's eyes, that this was actually working as intended. And frankly, that you know, my role within this was often to create the illusion of a spirited and healthy debate that would, you know, without having any agency to make real change. And, you know, this was, this was not necessarily like an easy revelation, um, but, you know, you, you got to look at what's real. Um, and so I did two things. Um, you know, a, a hand, you know, I think about five years ago, I started working with Kate Crawford, who is a, you know, my co-founder at AI Now, and really talking about the need for new stories, right? What we talk about tech, what we talk about is the fantasies of marketing departments so often. We talk about magical AI. We don't talk about the extractive practices, the precarious labor, the sort of historical biases that are built into these systems. We've only just started to sort of crack the surface of some of those conversations. How do we begin to redefine what these things are and put the people who are most at risk of harm put the context in which they are used, put sort of, you know, the lives and ecologies that they disrupt at the center of that conversation. Um, and that's the sort of project that Kate and I have undertaken in our research and in our work at NYU at AI Now. Um, and then, you know, a year and a half ago or so, I started organizing within Google. Um, and I didn't really know that's what I was doing when I started. I was just pissed. Um, and, for me, this started around the Maven contract, and some of you may be familiar with what this is, but you know, I, I, I was seen in the company as sort of like the ethics nanny, right? So any, anyone that had this sort of, you know, kind of discomfort with something they were working on would often email me and say like, hey, Mayor, can we grab coffee and just, you know, I want to run this by you. How do you ethics it? Um, oftentimes you can't, that's the spoiler. <laughs> um, but, you know, somebody brought, a, to my attention that Google had signed a contract with the DOD to apply Google, sorry, this is a groupie shirt. Um, Google had signed a contract with the DOD to build artificial intelligence for drone targeting. So, you know, that's not ethical. You know, the drone war has been declared you know, in violation of international human rights law by even the most mainstream organizations. This is not controversial. And here Google is sort of applying this expertise to basically automate killing, um, or ultimately automate killing. Um, and so, you know, as a, as a moral ethical person, you know, I had seen a number of efforts. There were engineers who were sort of escalating this. There were people who were sort of trying to bring arguments against it. It was proceeding, right? Because you know, the money in cloud services is in these massive government contracts. It is a strategic decision. It's not something that is sort of, you know, it's not that they didn't understand what they were doing, to come back to my earlier point. Um, so I wrote a petition against Maven. I started organizing with people. I started sort of, you know, effectively kind of theorizing this. Like, why is this bad? And someone would post, you know, it's, it's you know, I actually think it's good. And then a bunch of people would sort of create arguments in a doc and send that out. And it, it started this debate around sort of the role of tech and the culture of, you know, sort of tech companies that are sort of imbued into this technology um, was sort of the birth of this organizing. And I think it kind of, you know, there's just moments that happen and they're sort of novelistic, but it sort of, for me, the experience was sort of lighting, like, you know, there was a, the, a tinderbox moment where suddenly these questions were on the top of everyone's mind. People wanted to know what they were working on. People were you know, unsettled, and they began asking questions that would not have, you know, that would have been sort of dismissed or considered even juvenile, you know, a year before. Um, and there were a number of other kind of, you know, I would say that the, the contradictions inherent in tech were exposed in, you know, pretty clear form a number of times last year. Like, there's no, no longer a question of whether there are problems. It's like, how do we deal with this 
trash fire that is sort of Cambridge Analytica, you know, Amazon recognition, all of these things. Um, and then in November, you know, there were, there were a number of other moments we organized, but it was, you know, sort of building this pressure and building an ability to talk to each other as human beings about these things, not as employees, um, which is a, you know, that's a consciousness shift. Um, and then in November, this, you know, New York Times drops that uh, Andy Rubin, who is a, you know, he was one of the people who led the Android team, um, and he was given $90 million by Google as what we refer to as a sexual harassment bonus. There are credible claims that he, you know, coerced a woman into performing unwanted sexual activity in a hotel room. There are many other claims. The Whisper Network knew. Um, and he was given, you know, $90 million. Like, you know, and so we created the Rubin scale, and we started comparing all of the cuts we had experienced, all of the, you know, the wage and benefit gaps for contractors. Like, what percentage of $90 million is this? And that did a lot of things. One, it sort of catalyzed so many people who had our, our own experiences of sexual harassment, but it also catalyzed people who had other issues that they sort of felt deeply because it was such a clear indicator of executives' priorities, right? Like there was, you know, all of the, all of, you know, everything we've been told about cost cutting, everything we've been told about the need of the company to take certain contracts, et cetera, et cetera was placed in stark relief against this like, small group of elite men basically paying each other out, uh, irrespective of their behavior. And so I think this was, you know, the walkout was to my you know, slight discomfort characterized as a sort of march against sexual harassment. It was much more than that. And we were, you know, the, the organizers, or the other organizers and myself were really clear about like, this was about systemic inequality. This was about the system that would re reward these people uh, you know, while still not paying contractors who are mainly like black and brown people a living wage um, and looking at you know, what is the structural inequality and the culture within the company and then how is that reflected in the products and the decisions that a company with so much power in the world is, is making and the ultimate implications of those products you know, where they are used. So, you know, trying to create a structural analysis <coughs> and then sort of, you know, attack it where it lives, which is in, you know, the executive suites and the private jets. So that's me. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, well, we're going to be digging into a lot of the themes that that you that you both touched on. I just I just want to observe. I was so struck by um, Jacinta the way you lay out this migration of these technologies um, from war zone uh, to disaster zone to just this kind of rolling disaster, right? And nobody's better at rolling out a disaster nonstop than Trump. Um, but you know, further. Okay, um, <laughs> but I remember being in New Orleans, at, um, you know, when, when it was still partially underwater and people were calling it Baghdad on the Bayou, right? Because there were all of these contractors who had come fresh from Iraq and those contracts were starting to dry up um, and it was like, okay, natural disasters are the next big boom. We're going to privatize the whole thing. Blackwater was there. Halliburton was there. Bechtel was there. Um, we didn't realize what was going on with the surveillance tech. But I think there was a sense after a few years of this that it was so lucrative to just treat the government as your ATM, right? If that's a great business model. Um, but the problem with just going from war to disaster is that it's kind of an unreliable business model. And then it became clear that the next stable market is a war on immigrants, an endless war on immigrants. And we're seeing this around the world, right? We're seeing it with it, 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 you know, what used to be Blackwater, now you know, Eric Prince selling his services to the European Union um, to fortress the continent. We are, um, we see it with all kinds of these same contractors now getting into building private prisons. Um, so this is a part of a much, much, much bigger pattern. And I'm, I'm really glad to hear, Meredith, you talk about the need to put the stakes of this at the center, because I still feel like so much of the talk, even though we are talking more, it is still, I think, feels pretty low stakes to a lot of people. Like, oh, God, it's annoying that this pair of shoes I glanced at is following me around the internet. 
and sort of understanding, okay, this is an extractive business model, but understanding the human stakes of it, I think we, we, are, we are a long way from. Um, so I'd, I'd really like to hear first um, what, you, what commonalities you see in each other's work, um, the, the points, what points of connection. Do, do you want to start? Sure. Um, I mean, so we, we recently did, let's make sure folks can hear me, like we recently did a trip to San Francisco with a couple of, of Mi Gente members from, from the border region. So it was someone from Washington State, it was two folks from, one folks person from Texas, one person from Arizona, and one person from New Orleans. And we were able to have a, you know, a meeting with some tech executives and then also have some meeting with, with tech workers. And the, the one thing that was just very similar was fo folks were talking about one of the biggest things that's hard to overcome with tech workers is folks are afraid. Folks are afraid of losing their job. There are folks afraid to get a reputation as a troublemaker. They're afraid to, you know, what's going to happen if I do X, Y, or Z that's outside of the norm. And I was like, oh, yeah, 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 that's organizing 101, right? If you can imagine organizing with undocumented folks, the risks are the same or even bigger. I mean, if you demand your wages from your employer, you can immediately be blacklisted. If you, you know, are seen talking on the TV, right, like famous rappers today, you start to, to say things that people don't like, you will be targeted. And so I think that's something that people have in common. And I think what was really beautiful to watch is people through that conversation be like, oh, you could die if you do it and you still do. OK, I'll be a little bit braver. Um, and just having that conversation to help push each other and really understand what different tactics people could use, what kind of risks people could take was really important. But also understanding collective power. I mean, again, like the beauty of when you come together, when you do a walkout, how that changes you, how that kind of reinvigorates your commitment to like a bigger purpose, I think, is, is, is also part of the thing. Yeah. What about you? Yeah. I mean, I, I would echo that. I think we need, there's a lot that tech workers and sort of, you know, the, the soft-handed class need to learn from people who have been organizing for a long time, right? Um, and I think, you know, and actually need to make sure that the people on the ground are leading a lot of this, right? Um, because, you know, I don't actually think we can have an effective movement around these things without sort of building coalitions. And this is not sort of because it's nice to be together. It's because you can't see what's happening from any one position. Like tech is designed this way, right? It is, it is based on, you know, computation is based on abstraction. It is based on generalizing um, and scale, right? And these, these sort of commodified network technologies that are fueling what we call tech now are sort of based on, you know, maybe a couple of rich guys in a conference room generalizing who the human is. And then that, is the model that is baked into their product and it is shipped everywhere. And they will likely never know, or they, they, there, is, there is no accountability, there is no way for them to know really what the effects of that generalization were, are on humans in the real world, the diverse bodies that populate the world, the diverse contexts. There is no real way for them to know even how what they built was used, right? What, you know, these technologies are extremely modular. So you can build an AI model for recognizing objects. It can be used to, you know, say recognizing shoes. It can be used to recognize shoes in a department store. Um, I don't know why you'd want to do that. Or it can be used to, you know, recognize the shoes in a surveillance video and see if you saw the same pair twice or something, right? The person who built that has no chain of title. There's no way to know where that went. So we need to form these coalitions because we're not going to be able to process the stakes of these technologies without beginning to talk to each other and beginning to you know, learn from the experts who are the people on the ground whose lives are being shaped often by these obscure systems that they're not quite sure about. And so you know, sharing the knowledge about, OK, this is, this is what the system does. This is what the contract looks like. You know, these are the capabilities. And you know, then sharing the knowledge about, like, yeah, and this is what happens with our family when they started using it, you know, they, mm -hmm. they picked us up at school, whatever it is. Um, and those are, you know, those are muscles we need to build. And it's a way, again, of understanding, sort of organizing and understanding technology that I think is vastly different from at least what I've been taught and the kind of, you know, popular narrative. Well, I think it's particularly relevant to communication scholars and mm -hmm. students, right? Because this, it, it strikes me that this work is being, um, 
sliced and diced at, up into ever smaller parcels and an ever greater web of contractors who know, they don't even know who they're working for, right? They don't know where, where and, and this is, you know, lots of work that used to be higher wage is getting sliced into a small enough, you know, little piece that you can pay very low wages in the cloud, what's it being called now? The cloud yeah. employment or whatever. Or the, like, precarious click yeah. workers who, yeah. yeah. Um, so, I mean, these are, these, are, these are some of the sectors with the most jobs to offer graduates. Um, and it strikes me that a lot of students don't even know the jobs that they're going into, right? So that's one of the, one of the privileges of being in a university and, and being able to, to study this is to know a little bit about the workforce. Um, and yeah, I think to tell that story, like this is a social story of, of what is happening to our society. Um, and uh, and we're, not, we're not doing a good enough job of telling it, although I think that that's starting to change. Did you want to add something? No. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about the about gender and your work. I mean, it's it's obviously deeply connected to race, um, but it seems that a lot of the people you're working with are women. Yeah, I mean, there the impacts of a lot of these policies on women are very particular, and I think you know part of it is also understanding the history of the military industrial complex in the U.S. and the history of policing in the U.S. Right. It, there, there's ways in which Trump can make us feel like the war on immigrants is a new and fresh one, but we actually understand that it's part of a longer history where this country has had a war on black people and people of color for, since its inception. And so that's why police was created. And so obviously technologies are just helping facilitate that and strengthen that in different ways. And so the, the racial element is very clear, but the gender implications of that are also felt very, very deeply. Um, you know, when you're talking about the level of both violence that's happening in communities, but also criminalization, women internalize and have that experience in a particular way, particularly with families. And so what we've seen is, for example, the child separation crisis at the border, that criminalization hadn't been felt in such a way, but women had to carry a big brunt of that. Um, similarly, when we have raids, when people are being picked up, women are the ones who are having to deal many times when their partners are, or when their you know, husbands are, or partners are detained, having to pay the exorbitant bond costs, having to deal with having to sustain your children when your partner is in, in, in prison. So all of those things kind of are compounded in, 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 an, in, a, yeah, in a particular experience. Um, but then I also think when we're thinking about creating a vision of what this could be, who's on the front lines of being able to push forward those policies, we also see that a lot of those folks are women. Um, and so many times who's saying, okay, I'm going to raise my three kids and have to deal with this issue and then still go to the city council meeting and talk about my story. It, for, for at least for me, a lot of our members are women. And so we also start to see this like double shift where both like the burden of having to deal with a lot of the, the impact, but also having to lead a lot of the fight falls on, on, on women in a particular way. Um, and then when we really look at you know, who is the, the, the fastest growing um, population of people who are behind bars and who are being surveilled, again, it is women. Um, so I think there's also connections there that can be, you know, continue to be explored. Can you talk a little bit about the the, the contractor uh, hierarchy? Um, this is uh, this is true for all the big tech companies that it was pioneered by Microsoft and the workers pioneered the term permatemp um, more than twenty years ago and sued the company because they had a different color badge. They were working side by side. There's a really striking story about Google and what happened when there was a shooting at, at YouTube that I think would really shock people. Can you? to paint a picture of this caste system within Google and where it fit in with the walkout. Sure thing. Um, so Google will tell you that they have 100,000 employees. They actually have a little over 200,000 workers. A little over 100,000 of them are temps, contractors, vendors. So these are people who work for some sort of middle organization, um, some vendor. They're, you know, 
technically employed by someone who isn't Google, but they work on site at Google. And these can be people doing anything from marketing, design, to engineering. They can be leading projects. Um, many of them do work alongside full-time peers doing exactly the same work. Um, and they are treated much differently. They don't, you know, what some of the details, they don't get invited to the holiday parties. They're not allowed to um, sort of attend some of the all staff meetings. They often don't have benefits. They don't have sick days. They're in deeply precarious positions. You know, they're often trying to get hired as full time employees. So there's a lot of pressure on them to conform to any demand. A lot of overtime worked. Um, it's incredibly stressful. It's a lot cheaper for Google, and that's why you know, there's this push to sort of temp a lot of formerly full-time roles. Um, now, around the shooting at YouTube, and this is a, a story that my, um, my colleague and fellow organizer, Stephanie Parker, told, um, but, you know, she told me, and then she's, she's talked about it a little bit, but, you know, she works for YouTube, and they had the shooting, and they had a bunch of safety announcements that went out, including an announcement of a town hall. Now, these were only sent to full-time employees. So the people who are on the front lines are the security guards. There are people who are, you know, temps, vendors, contractors who are in the buildings um, doing the same work as their peers who just didn't know about it, right? So you can see actually the sort of material consequences of this caste system are pretty starkly illustrated by that example, right? You have people whose sort of well-being is not sort of thought of as part of Google's responsibility. And that goes all the way down the line, right? Um, and this is, you know, this is an employment practice that is really common in tech. It's becoming more common. I think, you know, we're getting into the sort of gigification of work. Um, and I think this is one of the symptoms of it. Um, now, for the walkout, it was really important to us that those be the people who were, you know, on to sort of those be the experiences that were censored, right? Those are the people who are the most vulnerable. They are also, you know, it, this caste system is, surprise, racialized and gendered, right? The most black people, the most black women at Google work as contractors and temps. A lot of, you know, if a black woman applies for a role, they will also be often be hired as a temp, even though they have their qualifications are over sort of a white man who is hired as full time. You know, this type of sort of inequity is is rife throughout Google. Um, but you see that these are the people who bear the most cost if they are, you know, sexually assaulted or abused or discriminated against. They have to report that to their temp agency. Um, or the, uh, not temp agency, but like the, the company that they officially work for um, and often don't get access to any of Google's services. You know, if a full-time Google employee is sort of causing them problems, they don't have remediation. Um, so it's, you know, I think it is kind of, you know, again, one of these practices that is at the heart, uh, you know, that, that illustrates the way in which tech is actually sort of built on these racist, discriminatory, misogynist cultures and that this is, you know, this is a practice that people are fine with. And then if you, you know, you kind of created a hierarchy, you see, you know, the most black and brown people at the bottom, you see sort of, you know, at the lower levels, you have, you know, some women and, and a couple. And then the farther you go up, it like, it gets whiter, it gets more male, it gets whiter, you know, our CEO is Indian, but, you know, that like, you know, across tech, you can generalize pretty clearly that that is how the hierarchy works. And, you know, this was, all, you know, one of our critiques in the walkout was that, yes, there are racist and sexist individuals and they are problems, but what we need to critique is structural racism. And what structural racism looks like is that hierarchy, right? It's not, you know, picking this one guy and kicking him out of the company, although that might be nice. It's looking at, like, why don't these people have health insurance? Why are people living in their cars while the CEO is making $400 million? How can we answer those questions clearly and sort of fix these basic grade school inequities so that, you know, people have dignity and, and a living wage. So. And I'm wondering if you feel that there's a connection in that, I mean, do you think that if these companies were more diverse, looked more like the United States, do you think that it would have an impact on the kind of tech that they're building and the impact of that on the communities that you work with. I mean, the numbers on Google, I think, are pretty striking. It's, I think it's 6.5% Latinx workers and, no, sorry, I think that might be Rutgers. Hold on a second. Let me check. No, it's 3.6 um, at Google and 2.5 black workers. So 
it does not look like the United States. Not look like the United. I feel like that's a trick question, um, and I will explain why. You know, for us, a, a big part of why we actually formed Mi Gente was because we kept being told that, well, don't worry, by 2050, the majority of the U.S. is going to be people of color anyway. So, like, well, it'll just fix itself by then. Um, and you know, Texas tells a different story, right? It's, it's worth looking into. Um, and really, this idea that demographics are destiny is, is incorrect. Um, and this idea that if we just change the face of things, it's going to function differently or have different values, it's, it's not. Um, so as long as it can, like, where it does matter is obviously when you have people approaching this from a point of view of superiority, they're not going to see what the damage is, for example, with creating war tools. And so we do need to have more people and more conversations to lift up that perspective. But simply changing the face and changing the makeup won't actually change what it's intended to do. I think what you said at the beginning, Mary, is that, like, it's, it's, this is the, its purpose. This is what it was meant to do from the beginning. When we look at the history of the internet, the history of technology, the history of all of these things, it was for war. And so obviously, as, as you talk about it coming, creeping closer and closer to our home, it's going to start to look in, in different ways. But simply saying, well, if we have a couple of black executives or a couple of Latino programmers, you know, that that's going to simply like, make technology stop working for surveillance, I, I don't believe that that is true. And so that's why we have to have bigger interventions that actually talk about the politics, that actually talk about what's happening, and also talk about wealth disparities. I mean, part of the reason why, you know, if you look at who, you know, Forbes' top richest people or whatever it is, there's no way to hide the fact that technology, that the technology industry is one of the driving forces for wealth disparities worldwide now. Um, and that's not going to change just because a couple of different, you know, we have different looking billionaires, right? It actually is about how we're talking about wealth disparities. It is actually how we're talking about how we treat our planet. It is actually about how we think about workers and how we talk about, you know, what we would say in Spanish, el buen vivir, right? Dignified life um, on this earth. Well, we had we had a question I really related to this about about you know you talked about Project Maven and how there was this worker revolt essentially at Google and you have an ongoing debate about whether or not your t Google's going to be working directly with the Chinese government to censor searches something that Google resisted while other companies went in and that's also something I want to talk about with both of you is like if we look to countries there are countries we can look to including China including India where you have a even deeper integration of the um, tech companies and the surveillance state, and very clearly these technologies being used to target activists to, uh, well, I mean, to go much further than that, right? So to do these sort of social scoring and so on. So I want to get your take on whether there's a place that you look at and go, you know, this is where it's leading. But it strikes me that part of what's happening is a lot of these companies have talked a good game about workplace democracy, and they have town halls and they have, you know, places, ways that workers can have input. Um, they kind of even deny that they have workers in that it's this sort of playful work environment. Full-time workers get shares. Um, but now we're talking about workplace democracy, right? And so this question was, you know, how do we ensure that tech workers have a say in the projects and contracts their company engages in? Is there a model to implement through tech companies to give workers this ability and power. I mean, that that's describing a worker co-op, not Google, right? So, but how would you respond to that? Um, I think there are models. Are they, do they, you know, how close are we to those models? Um, we're pretty far right now, right? These companies are built not to do that. Um, and actually, I kind of want to come back to a point you made earlier around sort of, you know, there's China and there's Indian and there's sort of these sort of baldly authoritarian countries that are sort of surveilling and targeting people. Um, and I think, you know, there are certainly, you know, countries that are sort of farther on the path, I guess, and much more open about the integration of sort of technology into these state forms of control. But one thing that worries me about the U.S. context is that this sort of private-public partnerships 
are often kind of off the record, right? We have all of these companies doing these as sort of startups or, you know, startups that are probably run on Amazon or Microsoft or Google servers, but, you know, nonetheless, you have a lot of these sort of interests that are deploying technologies that are protected by trade secrecy, that are not put through, as with the case of Palantir in New Orleans, that are not put through any sort of public scrutiny, that are sometimes not even announced to the public, that are used on populations without their knowledge, without their consent. Oftentimes, you know, their lives will be shaped without them recognizing that this sort of technology is the driving force behind that shaping, which is why I think your work is so important, sort of being like, pinpoint these guys. That's why they start, you know, that's why it's intensified now. Um, but that we are in a situation where these types of controls could very easily be implemented, right? All of the pieces are in place. We have facial recognition being deployed at real-time crime centers across 10 cities right now. We have Amazon pitching ICE, pitching Orlando, pitching Washington on sort of, you know, corporate-run facial recognition. We have, all, you know, these data brokers selling data. We have, you know, tracking devices on our cell phones that can identify us in, you know, a couple of minutes. It's all there, right? And if it were to sort of be suddenly implemented in some kind of panoptic surveillance context, and that would take some infrastructure, and, and you know, I don't see that happening immediately, it's unlikely we would know, right? What we know about China is they talk about it, right? And they sort of announce these things, and they have companies that talk about it. And when you look under the surface, you actually say, oh, you know what, it's not really automated. There are a bunch of workers paid a, you know, a penny an hour to you know, fake automation in the background by checking the photo and saying, like, yes, that is a Coke you know, or whatever it is. Um, but, you know, I think we need to look at, you know, how would we know and begin asking really fundamental questions about of accountability mm -hmm. um, that get to some of these, you know, some of the, you know, ways in which these private tech corporations sort of, you know, are able to build and deploy these technologies without really alerting us to their implications. And I think, you know, that doesn't answer your question about how would workers exert control. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, are workers exerting more control in a meaningful way now? I mean, workers are raising their voices, right? And that's something, you know, I am seeing around me. Control is a tricky word here, right? Because if you build an AI model, so I, I train an AI model to recognize faces on a bunch of data, and I am assured by the product team that is going to take that model, which is sort of a modular thing you can plug in, as I was saying, um, that it's going to be used to sort of, you know, help blind people identify their relatives, right? Which is a really... Like, you should be skeptical if anyone says that, because that would be a really bad use case. Um, there's no way right now for me to use, know that that happened, right? Contracts are often confidential. People don't know, you know, if they're building cloud services, which often contain these sort of AI add-ons, like with Amazon's facial recognition, um, the contracts of who uses those won't be known to the sort of researcher who, you know, built it, right? So again, these are modular, they're attenuated, it's sort of, you know, this perfect bureaucracy in which accountability is very hard, you know, in part by design, right? You know, the, the people who are cloud customers on Amazon, on Google, on Microsoft aren't known. There are contracts in some cases where there's actually an NDA, you know, making sure that neither company can talk about that contract. So beginning to trace these things, you know, if I design an AI model, beginning to trace where it's actually used is precluded structurally at so many layers that we would actually need to sort of dismantle this to make sure, like, when I had a say and I was like, I do not want that ever to harm, you know, the immigrant community, I could actually assure that beyond sort of lip service. And it, I mean, it's going to have to be some combination of organizing on the inside and the outside and regulation, right? I mean, these companies are not going to do it if they yeah. are, aren't forced to do it. Because what we, I mean, it, it's, it's, hard, it's hard enough, if it's this hard as a worker to know what's happening with your tech, I mean, when you're on the outside, you come straight up against proprietary information. You, you can't find anything out. So it, it, it's going to have to be a debate about our right to understand our world, right? I mean, this is one of the things that's really interesting about Shoshana Zuboff's book, The Age of Surveillance Capitalism, that I think she really nails, which is just this massive imbalance of knowledge, right? And once again, this is something that I, I think scholars really need to be grappling with. Like, there are severe limits on our ability to research the world. Um, our job as communication scholars is to understand this and so there are because this is now the model for just how we communicate because we're doing it all on proprietary platforms it is so much harder to just understand how we and you're trying to do some of this research yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, I, it strikes me too that, you know, it was such a game changer for you to get that research done, right? Can you speak a little bit about the importance of research for this organizing? Yeah, I mean, it, it is just so, it's so hidden and it's hard to understand. I mean, I, I was joking, my, my close circle kind of makes the joke that I'm a baby boomer in a millennial body. So I really have this deep skepticism about technology and other things. But trying to understand how it all works, how it all is all connected, who's making money off of it, how the technology is going to be implemented is almost impossible to understand. And so it was really important to do the research. And we had to partner with folks that actually had expertise in corporate research, right? So it's not even just understanding the technology, which is already confusing, but the corporate landscape of how it's being um, profited from and how it's being implemented is also incredibly difficult, right? You think you're dealing with 10 companies, and then you're like, wait, they all loop back to Google, right? You think that there's different contracts to figure out you know, cloud services, and again, they all link back to Amazon. And so figuring out how all of those connections happen is one, incredibly complicated. And then figuring out how some of the folks from these corporations and folks in the government are connected is another intricate web that we have to expose, right? So understanding how Peter Thiel, his connections with the CIA led to Palantir, which linked back to his support for his company, for his, you know, for Trump's, you know, run for presidency. All of those networks and understanding how that lobby in Washington is also impacting our policies, our, you know, what we watch when we turn on Fox News, all of those things are kind of other layers that are kind of added that we have to be able to, to unpack to be able to make the right interventions. Because it's not just about saying, well, this technology is good technology and this technology is bad, this company is good and this company is bad. They actually, it's, it's a little social network, right? We would actually need Palantir's help to be able to do the whole diagnosis of all of the information. But I think part of the reason, too, that you, know, you talk about like they do a good, good job kind of giving a facade of, of workplace democracy, you know, the truth is America's been doing the same for a while in terms of doing a facade of what democracy is supposed to look like here, right? Especially a lot of these technologies that are being used for, to sell products or all of this, it is actually about social control. It is actually about giving you the nudge to go and pass by this billboard to buy this particular shoe which is exactly the same logic that they're using when they say that there's intervention from X or Y Z country or X or Y Z powerful influence in how we vote and how we actually manifest ourselves in our, in our electoral system. Um, not to mention the fact that so many people aren't even allowed to vote just because of their immigration status or their criminal record. So you start to see a bunch of things that are kind of connected in, in that way and, and why it's so, so important to be able to do the research, but then also have conversations that people can understand and can relate to about this. Um, yeah. Now, there, it, it can seem a little hopeless, I realize. <laughs> um, but one of the things that's interesting is the, 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 these companies are vulnerable on some points, including on their image, on their brand vulnerability. And I think that's probably, I mean, you're, you both have used this in various ways. You know, going after Amazon, which is a company that does, you know, it, it sells directly to consumers a lot, right? Um, it, it's at risk if consumers get mad enough and there's various things that consumers are not happy about, right? Um, and, you know, it's pretty remarkable, I think, <laughs> to watch Google try to figure out how to deal with all you, <laughs> because you know some of the signs. I don't know if they were in that video, but you know workers were holding signs <laughs> saying things like "Don't be evil," right? That was that was you know that was Google's brand slogan for a while, right? Um, "Don't be evil." But ha what sort of vulnerabilities do you see in not all of these companies? Because Peter Thiel is not vulnerable. He's like basks in being you know a cartoon evil villain. I don't know if, if everyone knows who Peter Thiel is, but um, he had openly doesn't believe in democracy, um, shut down Gawker because he didn't like their coverage of him, and has a bunker mansion in New Zealand um, stockpiled with everything he needs when the apocalypse comes. So that's Peter Thiel. He's not too worried what we think of him. Um, but I think Google is. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I hope so. I think we have a window right now to do this. And I, you know, there's been a lot of awareness, and awareness is the necessary condition for, you know, figuring out how to sort of check this power. 
but I do think we have a long fight ahead of us, right? Like, they may not have figured out how to deal with us because, you know, we are them, right? We run their comms, we run their marketing, we run their cloud, right? Um, but, you know, they're going to, right? And I think we need to be prepared for, you know, for a bigger fight, and we need to be prepared to sort of treat this as sort of capital and power and not as tech that is somehow inscrutable and outside of accountability. Because this, you know, we need to flip this story. I think, you know, we are at a time where we are seeing sort of these, you know, networked technologies of, you know, sort of control and surveillance infiltrate, you know, more, you know, every social political institution. I, I imagine there are surveillance cameras somewhere in this building that are attached to some kind of machine learning model or, you know, early algorithmic system that is sort of classifying, you know, the images it picks up if there isn't some vendor is trying to sell Rutgers on that right now, right? We are watching sort of our social fabric be instrumented with these systems that are doing more than surveil us. They are sort of, you know, divining who we are, what we're worth, and whether we, you know, should or should not get resources. So we have AI technologies that are determining whether someone should be hired based on an image of their face during an interview. We have technologies that are determining which school you go to. We have technologies that are determining whether you're caged or whether, as a defendant, you get out on bail. We have you know, technologies that are profiling immigrants. And you know, I, think, I think we need to really sort of appreciate the term surveillance capitalism, but we need to go beyond it because we have wrested so much authority in these technologies. They can make a determination without having data about us, without knowing anything, and we have no way to contest that, right? And so we're in the realm where these, you know, these companies have produced this sort of mythology that these, these technical systems you know, under the name of AI are above scrutiny. And we are basically sort of resting control of our you know, social and political institutions to a small handful of people whose you know, values are ultimately shareholder value, right? And I think you know, ultimately, whatever else the technologies do, they have to do that. Um, and this is at a time of, you know, I pass it back to Naomi, like looming climate crisis when we're going to see, you know, you know, you know we're going to see these technologies implemented. And I have a, you know, that was not bright. That was, I, I didn't tell you how vulnerable Google was and that we could sort of overturn it, but I think, I think we need to take this, this isn't, you know, this is, it's nice that this is happening, but we need to recognize the seriousness of what we're up against and that this is, this is what power looks like now. They have bouncy balls and it's primary colors, but this is what power looks like. Um, this is standard oil, but, you know, bigger and larger and with capabilities we have not seen power have in the past. Yeah. Do you want to add something? <laughs> uh, I'll add a little bit of hope to that. <laughs> um, like, right now, the fight in New York actually gives me a lot of hope and gives me kind of, I think there's kind of this window of we can see a little bit of the damage that's being done to some of these companies. The yeah. Amazon fight. The Amazon fight, yeah, the Amazon head Carter fight. So, for example, Amazon, you know, talking heads went, went in front of city council and said, yes, we do work with ICE. We're very proud of it. Yes, we will not allow workers to organize. It's like, no, your audience, dude. Like, that's not actually who's in the city council chambers right now. And seeing people who have been part of the anti-gentrification fight, who have been part of, of the labor movement, who are part of, of protecting immigrant communities, who have been against policing, come together to sort of say, actually, no, not in my name, not in my city. This is not the, the, the vision of our community that we have. And do it with power, and it's definitely going to be a very difficult fight and a lot of technicalities over who gets to decide and who doesn't. But seeing that kind of movement that actually understands how we have to be in all of this together does give me a little bit of hope, right? I do think that that is where we're able to do it. And there's tremendous vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. I think the thing is we also have to understand that the vulnerabilities might not come in the places we expect them to. So a lot of times we're, we're very comfortable with our role as consumers. As a consumer, I will no longer, you know, 10 million people have asked me, like, should I cancel Amazon Prime? <laughs> maybe you should, maybe you shouldn't. But I actually don't know if that's how we're going to win. Because actually, it's like your Prime account is I don't know how many dollars, but the you know, Department of Defense cloud deal is $10 billion. 
right? We actually have to have much more of a, of a participatory democracy where people actually are making the interventions on their government and the vision of where we see our planet going than just kind of thinking about our circle of power and control is limited to where we spend our money. It's actually about how we can build things together. Well, I mean, that's the story of my life. Um, <laughs> since I wrote No Logo, people being like, you know, presenting people with structural problems and them responding with consumer solutions, which is just, um, you know, a, a symptom of the crisis of neoliberalism that we, it is hard to think of ourselves as more than consumers. Um, but there is a shift. So, and let me, let me try another angle of hope. Uh, Donald Trump in the State of the <laughs> Union address last night felt the need to assert that the United States was not going to become a socialist country. <laughs> I mean, I agree with AOC who said, you know, that she got a kick out of that because, um, you know, two years ago, one wouldn't have imagined an American president having to make it clear that the United States was not headed towards socialism. So there, this, this critique that you're making of consolidated wealth, saying it's not just about surveillance capitalism, it's kind of about capitalism and what it's turned into. Um, I mean, you think about what happened to Davos a few weeks ago, that even that bubble at the top of the mountain, you know, was pierced with, you know, various people coming in and saying, actually, we're tired of talking about philanthropy, let's talk about taxes and regulation, right? Um, where, do, like, where do you see this fitting in with this broader shift? Well, I would say that, that the, before I, I will go back to hope, I promise, but one other help, hopeless thing. When it, for example, right now when we're seeing this debate happening around the wall, right? You have Republicans saying, you know, lead, led by Trump, we want a brick and mortar wall. Mm -hmm. And the response from Democrats is, no, 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 we want a smart wall full of technology and surveillance lining the pockets of corporations. A lot of us are like, oh, shit, I'm not sure which one I choose. Like, actually, if I had to say which is going to cause the most harm, I'm actually not sure. So what actually gives me hope is this, this division that we're seeing a little bit within the typical, what we would consider liberal politics, of folks saying, no, let's talk about socialism. Let's actually talk about abolishing ICE. Let's talk about some ideas that might have seemed really radical and far-fetched at some point, but now are starting to become mainstream because people really see that that is the alternative to what is being built. So I do think that the conversation is shifting, but we still, we still got some more pushing to do to make sure that people sort of don't fall into the trap of thinking that, that technology is going to be the solution and that Jeff Bezos is really the one who should be you know, orchestrating the, the future of America. Yeah, it does strike me, listening to you, that this war that Trump has with Bezos is a bit of a, you know, sideshow here. You're describing a very deep collaboration um, with Amazon that goes well beyond his feud with the Washington Post. Meredith, will you help arm us for this smart border and generally the use of the word smart and why we should be so worried about it? Um, well, the use of the word smart is usually used to make people who don't want to feel dumb stop talking. Um, um, and it's often used around sort of technological solutions that people who don't know technology won't feel the sort of ability to question. Um, you know, you don't want to not know the engineering lingo. Um, and this smart border wall, you know, I, I'm just now reading the sort of RFPs and kind of the descriptions of it. But it's, you know, it is expanding a militarized surveillance state that is already, you know, well underway. And, you know, to be clear, this is not going to be the border like, you know, some line, you know, millimeter, you know, width line in the sand. This is going to be the 100 miles at least into the U.S., which is already the sort of border zone where they have enhanced um, surveillance and these sort of, you know, fusion centers and all of this where you have kind of a lot of data exchange and the sort of like DHS and police collaborating. Um, a lot of stuff that you guys have, have discussed and people like Ollie Winston at the Times have documented. Um, so you're basically equipping these, you know, the police, ICE, you know, DHS, whoever sort of a domestic, you know, army is with facial recognition. They want to do sort of DNA, um, some kind of DNA extraction and check. They want to do aerial surveillance with drones. 
um, that would do more than simply sort of identify cars. Um, they want to do, what else is like license plate readers that check the license plate back with sort of databases and dossiers they have. Now, like this is, we don't want to live there, right? Like I don't want to live there. This is a, you know, panoptic surveillance state where you have ICE being able to sort of, you know, take one image of your license plate, connect it with your profile that includes your face, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, this is bad enough, but if you begin to look at the sources of data that these sort of infrastructures are trained on, you have sort of layers of problems, right? A lot of times they are using sort of gang databases to profile people. Um, gang databases are notoriously flawed. We found sort of, you know, three-year-olds listed in gang databases, like three Latino men who are hanging out in front of a bodega will be put in a gang, gang, gang database. There's no way to contest it. There's no way to know your name is in it. You're simply sort of put on a profile list. So we need to actually, you know, we need to question these systems, their efficacy, and what kind of world they're creating for whom. But we also have to look at the way these systems are fed by data that is created by bias, racist policing practices, right? An arrest, you know, arrest data is a record of who the cops arrest at the end of the month, right? It's not a, a record of criminals. The gang database is a record of people the police or other authorities put in that database. Mm -hmm. And so these systems sort of reproduce, amplify, and then naturalize these kind of systemic inequality and biases in ways that you know would then be deployed at the border to give them authority to say like, hey, we matched your face to the database. It's you, you know, come with us. So you know that that's not you know a border solution. What we're talking about is a sort of militarized technocratic surveillance state that will certainly not be contained to sort of you know some small region. So we should not do it. <laughs> 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 it, it, it strikes me that there's a lot, that there's, a, there's a tension around a growing awareness about the biases in AI, that bad data is, is feeding these systems. There's quite a bit of research going into this. And at the same time, I feel like it sets up the expectation um, that's that Jacinta spoke about earlier, which is like this idea if we could, if we could kind of like make it more equal, somehow that will be okay. So I'd love to hear both of you on this tension of like, yes, we need to highlight the fact that the inputs into these systems are biased on all kinds of fronts. They are racist on all kinds of fronts. But how do we not then make the task, well, we need to fix the data, but we're accepting the premise that we're under surveillance all the time. Do you, do you wanna start? I mean, we were just having this conversation. We're like, why do people just keep saying that recognition is ineffective and that, or like, you know, they ha they will be less likely to be able to successfully identify someone who's a person of color or a woman. We're just giving them like two years to be able to like perfect their technology to be able to implement it. Um, and honestly, we've seen that time and time again in the immigrant rights movement. Remember, a couple of years ago, there was this huge fight around secure communities, um, whether or not they should be sharing data between the police and immigration authorities inside of jails. And they were like, well, it's only 97% effective. What about the other 3%? Well, now it's 100% effective, and we got it everywhere. Um, so we do see the dangers. I think part of it is that we actually have to continue to develop movements that are more, that have deeper understanding of why we have a police state to begin with. If we actually go back to the history of lantern laws in this country or why police was created, it was actually about controlling black bodies. And that is the root cause of it. And so obviously, as you continue to expand on that and think about global military invasions or, or occupations, different interventions that have happened, think about the war on, on migrants, you start to understand how all of these pieces fit in. And so it is about being able to use it to get at those root causes, because if not, we're just going to be finding the different, you know, it's, instead of having a, a brick and mortar cage, it's going to be a softer digital cage. But it's still actually about controlling people's both you know, what they're doing with themselves, but also how they're thinking and how they're shaping the world. Yeah, I, I, unsurprisingly, I agree. Um, um, I mean, I think there is sort of a, I guess, a line that Kate and I have used in some of our talks, like parity is not justice, right? These systems recognizing everyone equally doesn't ask, answer the question of whether they are being used to you know, perpetuate oppression or in a way that sort of you know, amplifies justice. 
And you know, this is a real fight right now because the people who pioneered the research on sort of bias were talking about social contexts, right? They were discussing the way in which the data we have is actually an imprint of the already, you know, warped, racist, et cetera, you know, social systems from which it is collected. And then that is sort of fed into these systems to create models of the world that reflect that, right? What happened with that research as these, you know, this is sort of a, a, a potted history, um, as these technologies were sort of, you know, commodified or, or sort of, you know, became the next big thing for a lot of these tech companies, is that they had to sort of grapple with the, these issues, right? Like, yeah, these, these technologies, they, they, you know, when they give a bad result, when they sort of, you know, discriminate against people, when they can't recognize someone, it is usually along the lines of the sort of historical discrimination and bias, right? It's women, it's people of color, et cetera, right? Um, and so they narrowed the problem set to, a, you know, basically how do we solve this technically? And how do you solve it technically? You start tweaking the data, right? You, try and, you, know, you start trying to ensure some statistical threshold to make sure that, like, everyone with some Fitzpatrick skin, you know, scale at X is recognized equally, but that cut off both ends, right? Like that didn't actually talk about the social systems that create mm -hmm. such data. Like there's no data outside of that in a lot of these cases, right? It so, shares the imprint of its creator or the ultimate application of these systems and the fact that they completely unbiased by their standard systems, you know, if we're talking about facial recognition, if it's sold to the police, it will likely be used in communities of color to profile and to oppress. So that is not an unbiased system by a definition that you know anyone who has sort of been in the field for a while would have you know adhered to. But it has you know again it's this sort of abrogation of the term and then narrowing the problem set to something that is technically tractable, where you know the company selling it can then claim victory. We we're, we're running out of time. There's going to be a reception, and folks can can talk to our guests a little bit more there. Um, there, there are some amazing communication scholars in this room and, and graduate students who are thinking about what they're going to be focusing on. Are there a few specific areas, and I, I put this to both of you, where you're seeing holes in the research, where, it, 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 where, where the research maybe has the most chance of leading to structural changes as opposed to Band-Aids? Um. I mean, yes, I think we need a whole new set of narratives, right? When you are confronted with an advertisement for AI, when you see Common at like MBA halftime talking about Microsoft AI, if anyone watches that, um, like, you know, pause for a second. Who wrote that? What is he actually talking about? When he says AI, WTF does he actually mean? Because that's a whole other story about, you know, there's a whole kind of set of capabilities that are actually quite limited that are sort of grouped under this magical talismanic invocation. Um, so beginning to tell different stories, beginning to take, you know, first take these sort of ads, take the keynotes, take all of this at its word, but then deconstruct it, right? You know, and, and I think, you know, that's, that's, you know, work that Kate and I have done somewhat, and that's work that people are looking at, but I think, you know, what is the, the mythology that has been written into our media, into our sort of, you know, popular understanding of tech? And how do we begin to deconstruct that? Because I, you know, I've been on the inside for a long time, and I will tell you, most of the understanding of tech that I see about like what AI is, what it can do, what technology does, is again, as I said, like written by marketing departments. There is not a counter story that I see out there, you know, talking about power, talking about context. And I think we need to hydrate that right now so people can begin to sort of place themselves in that story, even if they're not an engineer, right? Even if they don't really want to stem. Right? You know, like how do we recognize that there are like billions of other stories out there that are like equally valid and in a lot of cases much more urgent than the ones that have been told by sort of, you know, these companies. Um, and that's, that is one strain. There are a lot of other research questions if you want to talk at the reception. But. Yeah. Long list of research questions. Let me know. <laughs> um, but I do think the, the different stories, and I think t telling about the, the human impacts of some of these technologies, I think that th those stories haven't gotten out there um, really as much as they could, right? What does it feel like to be, to live by the border? What does it actually feel like to have the drones be flying over your head? These are some of the stories and the images that I think for a lot of people are, are They've never been there, so they don't imagine it. So then when someone like Trump comes and tells, pitches a particular story, it's easy to consume. Mm -hmm. And so we actually do need to have folks that are able to tell the other side of that. 
um, and are able to tell also the story of, of corporate greed in all of this. Um, you know, one of the things that was really striking about Trump talking about in the, the State of the Union, his way of attacking Democrats is saying, well, you have a wall around your house, right? That's, that, that image actually resonates with a lot of America. What is the, actually the image that will resonate with a lot of Americans to understand why this technology is so dangerous and how it's actually you know, creating worse lives for us, not necessarily just improvements of what we see? So I think there's a lot that can be done. Thank you both for that. Um, we, we're at the end of our time, so we don't have to sketch out the future dystopia, because <laughs> we already kind of did. Um, <laughs> It's been a, a real honor speaking with both of you. Uh, um, I think just it was just yesterday, New York Magazine r ran a really great article about the workers' movement at Google. And um, the last line of that article was, by now it's clear that the tools of tech could surely start a revolution or stop one. Um, and it strikes me that that really sums up where we are, not just as Google at Google, but in the broader society. These tools enable incredible connection and communication, but they also enable unprecedented surveillance and repression. Uh, in which way it tilts, I think, depends on the forces that we've been talking about today. Workers, organizers outside, on the front lines, scholars, journalists, um, crossing all of these boundaries. The stakes are incredibly high. Thank you so much for coming today.